we give them Yeah, okay. Ready to go? Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Gila Marto, MPP for Thornhill, and I'm here with some federal politicians because we're all concerned about the situation in the Middle East for the Yazidi community. Um, we've had some very bad news even this week um, out of the Middle East for the Yazidis, and just this week um, we're celebrating a sad celebration of the Sinjar massacre. So I want to introduce Michelle Rempel first. She's the MP for Calgary Nose Hill and the immigration critic for the federal caucus of um, the federal conservatives. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your commitment to this issue. I know that this is something you've been working to raise awareness with as well. Uh, as uh, MPP Marteau uh, described, this week marks the second anniversary of the massacre at Sinjar which uh, saw thousands of Yazidis um, killed, executed, and brought into slavery. To date, this genocide has been deemed a genocide by the United Nations, and we know that there are still thousands of Yazidi women who are being held in captivity, who are being raped dozens of times a day by many different um, so-called Islamic State fighters. And this is a situation that we strongly believe that Canada has a role to play in this. My colleagues here, um, uh, Peter Kent, as well as Dean Allison, who are respective critics for uh, foreign affairs and international development uh, in the federal government, will have some remarks. Um, my role in the official opposition is critic for immigration, refugees, and citizenship. Earlier this month, we had a study in Ottawa which looked at uh, ways that the government can expedite the asylum claims of Yazidi applicants. We had many recommendations come out of this study which we feel that it's imperative for the government to act upon right now. Uh, we strongly feel and call upon the federal government to expedite the applications of Yazidis and we know that the Yazidi people even have trouble getting onto these lists. Uh, so there's many recommendations recommendations that we made uh, that we uh, issued a press release on last week and in commemoration of the August 3rd 2014 massacre uh, we continue our calls upon the government to do so. Um, with that I'd like to introduce uh, a member of the um, Yazidi community here in Toronto who has been a very vocal and strong advocate uh, for the Yazidi people internationally but certainly uh, ensuring that Canada has a strong response to this situation. So with that I will turn the floor over to Mirza. Okay, first of all I would like to thank you so much for your uh, continued support. Uh, my name is Mirza Ismail, I'm the chairman of the ESD Human Rights Organization International. Uh, my special thank is to Conser Conservative Party for its continuous support from the beginning until now, which they have been working very hard. On the issue of all minorities in Middle East, such as uh, the ESD, the Kildo Syrian Christian, the Mandians, the Baha'is, and other vulnerable communities in the Middle East, especially in Iraq and Syria. And my special thanks to uh, Honorable uh, Peter Kent, Tony Clement, uh, Michelle, and Gila for uh, organizing this uh, event, uh, the commemoration of the second anniversary of the ESD genocide that began on August 3, 2014. Two years ago, on August 3, the Islamic State attacked the ESD in Sinjar region, and three days later, the ISIS attacked the ESD and Kildo Syrian in the Nineveh plain, where the ESD and Kildo Syrian have lived there for more than 6,700 years, which used to be called uh, Mesopotamia, an ancient homeland for the Yazdian, Kildo Assyrian, Christian, and Mandians. In Sinjar, there were more than 8,000 uh, Karji Peshmerga to defend the ESD region, but unfortunately, the Karji militia did not fight against ISIS at the time and refused also to give any weapon to the ESD to fight against ISIS to defend their families. And even though many of the local uh, Kurds, Arab, and Turkmen joined up with ISIS and killed, raped, and enslaved the ESD women and girls. However, the ESD with their very light 
weapon try to defend themselves for four or five hours while the rest of the community were trying to to flee to Sinjar Mountain for their uh, safety. Now it has been two years ago that genocide by ISIS uh, took place against Yazdian, Kildoasiyan, specifically because they consider us infidel and we are, especially the YSD, are not the people of the book. So they are encouraged to kill us, to enslave us, to rape our women, whatever is possible to do until they convert them to Islam or get rid of them. And still the international community is silent. Meanwhile, the UN, US, UK, EU, and Canada recognize the ESD as victim of genocide. But what has been done to prevent it from happening again since the recognition of the ESD genocide, if anything at all, such as bringing the ESD refugees who are struggling to survive in refugee camps, in UN refugee camps in Turkey, in Syria, and in Greece. Even though in, in Greece, the ESD refugees have been attacked by Syrian Arab, by Kurds, and by Afghans several times. In camps in where the refugees are in Germany, they were attacked. In Turkey, they were attacked. So Canada said they would bring the vulnerable people. But is there any any other group that's today more vulnerable than the ESD and Kildo Assyrian, Christian, and Mandian in the Middle East, especially in Iraq and Syria? So our demand from the, the Canadian government to bring as many refugees as possible from Turkey, Syria, and Greece, they are the most vulnerable people today. And we also ask Canada to, to bring the abducted GSD who were able to escape from ISIS. Those who escaped from ISIS, they can, they can be in Canada under the Section 25 of the immigration law. Also, we ask Canada and Canadian to call on their MP, MPPs, to do action, to make some action. Meeting without action is not going to get us anywhere. We have been meeting many times, probably like hundreds of times, in different, in Canada, in US, in Europe, and other parts of the world. But what has been done to save the remaining of the Yazdi and Kildo Syrian and Sabian community in, in the Middle East. We also ask Canada to be a leading hand in rescuing more than 3,200 Yazdi women and girls who are being sex slave and being held in captivity by ISIS for two years now. We also ask Canadian Foreign Affairs and Canadian government to intervene with the Iraqi government to establish a safe zone slash creation of an autonomous region for the ESD and Kildo Syrian and provide the military training and military equipment so these people can defend themselves in case another attack happen. Uh, neither of the, the group, whether Yazdi or uh, Kildo Syrian Christian, we cannot trust the Iraqi government, we cannot trust the KRG government to protect us uh, again. Because they were there, they didn't fight against ISIS. They were there, they didn't give us any weapon to protect ourselves. So we ask for international support so that the Yazdi and Kildo Syrian, the one who is still in Iraq and Syria, can. Uh, can protect themselves and survive through in their ancient homeland. And at the uh, last but not least, we hope that all of you, all of you, we need your help, we need your support to do something. To do something so these people uh, can come to Canada, can survive as human beings with dignity and respect as they are. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Mirza. Um, just prior to introducing my colleague, Peter Kent, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Majid El Shafi, who is uh, part of One World International, who's been doing a lot of work on the ground, bringing Yazidi people to Canada, or trying to, as well as my colleague, uh, to the Honorable Tony Clement, uh, who has been actively um, vocalizing these issues as well. Uh, our, my colleague, the Honorable Peter Kent, uh, is our official critic for foreign affairs and uh, has prepared a statement. <coughs> Thanks, Michelle. And I look forward uh, to receiving a debrief um, from Majid and, uh, and Tony on their uh, mission just last week to, uh, to uh, northern Iraq uh, and visiting some of the camps and getting some first-hand updated uh, information uh, that we uh, have not been able to get from the Liberal government. And I would like to, uh, I'm the member of parliament for Thornhill, and I'd like to thank uh, again my uh, provincial counterpart, uh, Gila Marto, for enabling uh, uh, this event here today. As the official opposition's uh, foreign affairs critic, and in light of the silence from the Liberal government since the genocide was recognized uh, in June, uh, we're calling on the Liberal government to urgently reassess, uh, with a whole-of-government approach, Canada's diplomatic agenda, Canada's immigration program, Canada's military contribution to the anti-ISIS uh, coalition, in Iraq and in Syria, and Canada's humanitarian assistance delivery protocols. Canadians have been left pretty much in the dark since the genocide uh, was recognized, despite the range of obligations that were triggered uh, as a signatory to the UN Genocide Convention. Where the government currently defers to the United Nations High Commission on Refugees to identify refugees for resettlement, uh, and the government boasts that Ottawa does not track refugees by religion or ethnic ethnicity, uh, we believe that the, recognize, the recognition of the genocide uh, and the associated atrocities that continue to be committed today should immediately prompt a change in the selection process, prioritizing the acceptance of uh, Yazidis and other persecuted uh, minorities. In short, Canada we believe should circumvent, uh, because of the urgency of this crisis, circumvent the UNHCR uh, process for all of the reasons that, uh, that you've heard already here today. As well, Canada must much more aggressively encourage Security Council members, particularly uh, veto-wielding uh, Russia and China, to request intervention of the International uh, Criminal Court. We in the official opposition also believe that Canada is now obliged to restore a much more robust contribution to the Allied coalition, uh, which is fighting to defeat ISIS, Daesh. The Independent International Commission uh, has recommended um, in its report uh, filed in June and endorsed by the United Nations in June that all parties fighting against ISIS strongly consider rescue plans for Yazidi captives. That should apply, I believe, also to the internally displaced persons who are accessible today to rescue uh, in the Kurdish autonomous state. Um, and these are internally displaced people who are not officially recognized or certified by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. However, the expedited defeat of ISIS on the battlefields in Syria and Iraq uh, is essential, uh, is essential uh, for the rescue of the thousands of dispersed Yazidi prisoners still being abused, still being murdered, still being victimized, as you've heard here today. We also believe that the uh, Defense and Foreign Affairs Committees update briefings that were held regularly under our previous Conservative government should be restored as soon as possible to properly inform Canadians on this extremely important mission, on this extremely uh, important humanitarian tragedy. We respectfully submit that the genocide, the continuing genocide, demands action by the government now. This is simply too important for the government to back burner until Parliament resumes in September. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Peter. I would also like to uh, uh, 
acknowledge and uh, I, we're deeply honored to have uh, Nadia Murad, who has been a international voice for the Yazidi people here, uh, whose strength and courage should be a light and uh, a, a force of action uh, in all international communities. So thank you, Nadia, for being here in Canada, uh, here to commemorate August the 3rd and all the work that you've been doing. Uh, with that, I would also like to introduce my colleague, Dean Allison, who is the official opposition critic for international development. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle. And uh, to all those that have traveled to be here today as well, thank you for, uh, for taking the time uh, to show uh, your support. Uh, you know, at two years, uh, this is not a, a great anniversary that we're uh, recognizing right now. And I, as we look at what has gone on, we look at what uh, this current government has committed to the area. There's been, uh, there's been over $200 million committed to Iraq, but yet nothing in terms of uh, your cities and, uh, and to the challenges that they have to endure in, uh, in, in Iraq and in camps uh, in the surrounding areas. And so what I'd like to call the government to do is to set aside some funds uh, to also to look at how they can affect, how they can help uh, your cities and camps, uh, displaced people and all over the region because we've heard through testimony, as Michelle mentioned, uh, in committee as recently as a couple of weeks ago, uh, funds are not getting on the ground. And as I said, you know, while $200 million to Iraq uh, may seem like a great thing, we, we've heard issues of corruption and there's, there's still challenges there. And what we heard more than anything is that we need to see dollars delivered on the ground. And so I would just encourage and I would strongly uh, compel the Government of Canada to set aside funds so that they can help your cities and they can help them not only in the camps but they can go to bat for them in the surrounding regions and they can start issuing and start respecting some of the protocols that we've seen uh, requested by the United Nations. And so once again to all those that have traveled to be here today and, and have worked on this issue for a long time, thank you very much. Uh, it is important that we be here today to continue to raise the issue on this particular event in time. Thank you, Dean. Um, because uh, Nadia was able to attend today, we weren't sure if she was going to or not, I would like to invite Nadia Murad Bassi up to the stage to give her account. Uh, Nadia is a survivor of sexual slavery in, in Iraq at the hands of ISIS and has become an international beacon of hope for the Yazidi people. So I'll introduce Nadia as well. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having us here. I'm, uh, I'm going to be the translator for Nadia. My name is Haider Elias, co-founder and president for Yazda organization, the international organization that established to support the Yazidis around the world, and especially in Iraq. And currently we have been uh, administering more than 10 projects in Yazidi community and IDP areas, such as education, cultural preservation, humanitarian aid, health care, psychological therapy, and also education and scholarship for the Yazidi community. And we came here and we were thankful to you to, to invite us to this uh, meeting with this event, which is, uh, we're grateful to that. Uh, I think uh, Nadia can start. I will be inter interpreting her, her, her message. Uh, Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you, Canada. This, this is the second anniversary that is happening to the Yazidi people. Today, that happened, the genocide happened to the Yazidi people, and, and it's still continuous. It's not a commemorating, it's not something we remember. It's still going on, it's continuous. And it's been two years right now. Over 3,000 men, women, and children in Iraq and Syria and their ISIS control and their activities, their uh, captivities. I mean, hundreds of Yazidi people have been uh, drawn in the seas trying to flee from the genocide campaign. In there have been thousands of Yazidi people still living in Iraq. And in the past two years, the Yazidis are still living in critical conditions. 
The thing that has happened to those women who have uh, been victimized by ISIS that I cannot imagine to tell you how much they've gone through. Since August of 2014, thousands of those girls, men, women, and children have been uh, committing atrocities against those, those people, and the ISIS has not stopped yet. And it's been two years, which is incredible. In two years, it's been two years that the Yazidi people have almost stopped living, that the, that the best supporting life uh, conditions that they, there have been thousands of, of women that have been uh, survived or at least escaped from ISIS, and they, yet they don't have any psychological or any humanitarian support for them or social support. Today in Canada, what I am asking you and what I request from the Canadian people, Canadian government is to bring the Yazidi case and move the Yazidi case and support it and support these uh, women and, and female children who've been survived from ISIS. And I have great hope that uh, the Canadian government is going to help us with the immigration, bringing some Yazidi families to Canada, uh, bringing something and, and tell it, doing something tangible for the Yazidi community, bringing these families here. And once again, I want to thank you for bringing me over here. And this has been two years and it's still happening now. Thank you, Michel. And I appreciate it, anybody who has uh, committed uh, to supporting this cause of Yazidi people. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you And for anyone interested in hearing the much more detailed uh, and uh, devastating testimony that Nadia delivered before the Immigration Committee uh, uh, in mid-July, uh, you can refer to the committees of the House of Commons uh, to the dates that were probably July 18th, 19th, 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 20th. Yeah. I just want to say, uh, first of all, thank you for everybody coming out and showing their support. But I want to thank in advance everybody who's watching at home. And I know you're trying to enjoy your summer. I know it's been a beautiful, hot summer here in Canada. We live in one of the best countries in the world. But we've got big hearts here in Canada. And I know that you want to help. And uh, I'm appealing to everybody to take the time to phone, to email, to write a letter to the editor, get in touch with your MP and even your MPPs, and say that this is something that um, Canada can do more and should do more to help uh, the Yazidi community and uh, offer your support and your help. Um, I just want to mention that uh, there's a lot of communities that have been supportive of the Yazidi plight yes. and uh, there's Mennonite communities uh, that have sponsored Yazidi uh, refugees. There are uh, Assyrians, Kurdish, the Jewish community has um, been appealing for more help internationally and even here in Canada. B'nai B'rith hosted an event that I spoke at this year and uh, many people from the Yazidi community and the Jewish community and other communities as well were there to offer their support. Uh, just this week in Thornhill, which is my riding, Mordechai Kadar uh, gave a lecture. He's a lecturer. He's an expert on ISIS. Uh, he speaks Persian. He speaks Arabic. He speaks Hebrew. He speaks English. And he focused on the plight of the Yazidi community, specifically the girls and the women. He even showed in his slide presentation a price list for women and girls. And the younger, even one years old, one to 10 years old, was the highest price on the list um, because they were considered, I guess, virgins. And um, uh, it's, it's shocking. It's hard for us to um, understand the suffering that other communities are going through in the world uh, when we have it so good here in Canada. But as Canadians, uh, we um, want to reach out and help. And um, first, we need to be educated. But next, we need to um, pressure our politicians to do more. And I think that the public really wants politicians of all levels of government, of all parties, to work together. And I hope that people um, appreciate that we're um, working together here, the provincial uh, progressive conservatives, with our federal um, conservative counterparts 
to appeal to the um, Trudeau government to do more to help the Yazidi community. So thank you for everything you're doing, and thank you for everything you're going to do, and thank you to all my colleagues who came out today. Thank you. Thank you.